Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We'll start with uh, Clark Barrett, uh, whom uh, you probably know, but um, who um, got his PhD at, at Stanford a number of years ago now and uh, is now at New York University and I learned this morning was also a summer intern here at uh, Microsoft Research in 1993. So, welcome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, I think maybe a couple of you may have seen this talk at PD Par. Did any of you see it? Okay, good. Mandan, you saw it? All right, you saw it. Um, so I have a little more time today, uh, so I'm going to go through parts of it a little more carefully. But, but certainly, if you have questions, let me know. Um, just to kind of set the context for this, uh, like uh, Rustin said, uh, Cesare and I are now the, uh, the sort of joint project leads of the latest version of the CVC project, which we've called, for lack of imagination, CVC3. Uh, actually, we're trying to build on our brand name, I guess. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's exciting, and one of, the, one of the reasons we're here at Microsoft is we're really interested in, in getting more, more interfaces with people who really need their improving tools, and we're interested in what kind of features you need. We're interested in hooking up real systems and getting all of this stuff to work. Um, and of course, you have lots of theorem proving expect, uh, expertise here, but our hope is that we can learn from each other and uh, you know, continue to push things forward in this, what I think is becoming a very exciting field, the uh, automated reasoning and especially the satisfiability modulo theories. All right, so the talk today is about uh, a particular theory, the theory of Recursive data types, also known as algebraic data types or term algebras. There's various uh, names that people have thrown around for this over the years. So uh, less important than name, I guess, is the definition. So let's, uh, let's talk about what it is. Uh, the idea here is you have um, simple data types built up using type constructors and then type selectors and type testers that you use to recover the data that was built up with constructors. Now, the, uh, the most obvious example, of course, is the old list example where uh, we define a constructor cons uh, that can build a list out of some, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with assorted uh, logic here. So we have uh, the type int, the type list. And um, then null would be a nullary constructor that takes no arguments. Now, you're certainly familiar with this data type and, uh, you know, if in functional languages, you can build up arbitrary data types like this. The thing that maybe is a little bit interesting is how, does, how do you actually now model this in first order logic? Uh, it's, actually, it's not too difficult. Um, so the idea is we introduce a sort for each uh, data type, and then each constructor and selector is a function symbol in first order logic, and the testers become predicate symbols. Um, and then you can write formulas about these kinds of data types with things like this. You could say for all x that is uh, natural, uh, the successor of x is not equal to zero. Let's see, I think I had a definition of that here. Oh yeah, here's, here's another. You can define natu the natural type as having two constructors, the zero constructor and the successor constructor with the corresponding selector or destructor predecessor. Uh, okay, so example of a formula you might write is for all x of type nat, um, the successor of x is not equal to zero. And similarly, a list is either null or it's constructed uh, using the cons constructor. So um, probably it's not too difficult to see the, the correspondence between the functional data type as you might define in ML or scheme or something and then these logical formulas that say something about those data types. And what we were interested in is then, uh, you know, suppose we want to reason about these things, um, what's the best way to do it? Uh, so in order to 
to uh, look at this problem more generally, we want to consider just a generic uh, data type that has an arbitrary number of constructors. And uh, each constructor can be built with zero or more uh, arguments, all of uh, possibly different sorts, including the sort being uh, constructed. And then you have testers for each constructor. Now, in the paper, <coughs> we actually have uh, a slight extension of this. So not only can you have uh, multiple constructors, you can also have mutually recursive data types. And it turns out that that uh, extension is, is very easy to do. Uh, it's just a simple matter where well, there's one of the rules that you just change a little bit in the decision procedure, and it, it works very nicely uh, with uh, recursive types as well, or mutually recursive, I should say. Uh, but I'll focus just on a single type for this talk. OK, and then you can write it this way. Uh, it's a little more compact and maybe easier to read. You just list all the <coughs> constructors, and you list each selector within the constructor that it belongs to, and then the type uh, for each selector is listed there as well, or the sort. All right, so that's the, the general framework. <coughs> um, and each, each of these uh, S's there, the lowercase S's, is either an external sort, like a, uh, an int or a bool or something, or it's one of the sorts being defined by your uh, recursive data type. Uh, as a technical point, we're assuming uh, when, when we look at the semantics of this, well, actually, even the syntax, we assume that we have an infinite number of constant symbols of the non-RDT types. We don't actually need that uh, for the decision procedure, but it simplifies the exposition. All right, so now um, I've told you what the syntax is. We have these constructor symbols, uh, selector symbols, tester symbols. And now the question is, how do we interpret these? What is the semantics? And the semantics we're interested in is actually the semantics of a particular model. So the model is just um, the, a term model. And what you do is you just look at the constructors, and then your infinite number of uh, constants over the base types. And then you can build um, arbitrary terms, L look at all the ground terms that you can build with those symbols. That's your term model, and that's the model that we're interested in in terms of uh, is there, uh, can we satisfy a particular formula in that model? Okay, it's a very natural model. It's, it's the model that you would expect, uh, but that's just to be precise. Um, okay, and then uh, once you have the model, you can talk about the interpretation of the uh, various symbols in the model. So uh, the testers, are just true if the term that they're applied to evaluates to uh, uh, something that was constructed with the appropriate constructor. Um, a selector, if it's applied to the corresponding constructor, so notice I have S sub J applied to constructor C sub J, uh, then it just selects out the kth argument. Now, one of the tricks with this theory is you have this, uh, this partial function problem, which is it's perfectly legal in first-order logic to apply any function symbol uh, to any term. And so we can apply a selector symbol to some uh, constructor that was built with a different, to a term that was built with a different constructor. So it turns out that people um, define this in various ways uh, over the years. And Really, when you're thinking about applications, the definition of this doesn't matter so much because typically what you want to do is check that this never happens or that if it does happen, it can't affect the, the value of your formula. So, um, so there are various ways to do that. And so what we, we essentially just, just say you can choose some arbitrary ground term uh, and, and define the theory that way. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, so notice that one thing that people have done in the past for this is just to define this to be the identity operation. Uh, we can't quite do that because we're, we're really ca we care about the underlying sorts. So a, se a selector has a particular type signature, and so it has to return something of the right type, and the thing it's applied to may be of the wrong type. So the easiest way to deal with this was just to 
say you're allowed to designate an arbitrary ground term of the appropriate type and we'll just use that. Uh, okay. Now, the question we're interested in is let's see if we can determine the satisfiability of an arbitrary uh, set of literals um, with the syntactic form I showed you over the model R, which is this term model. Okay, so it's a well-defined problem now. We know what the syntax is. Uh, we know what the intended model is. Uh, we have semantics for all the operations. So now it's just a question of how do you decide it? What's the, what's the best way to do it? And um, it, actually, when I first looked at this problem, uh, people had implementations of it. It's been around for a while. And I looked at the literature, and the thing that I found a little bit frustrating was nobody had really covered the problem in this level of generality and at the level of an implementation uh, that, you could, that you could actually uh, use. And so what I thought was just going to be an exercise in understanding what had been done turned into uh, some original research. So what, what is out there? Uh, there's this original work by Oppen uh, that is probably the most cited in terms, uh, if you look in the current literature, people say, well, this problem was solved by Oppen. Uh, the problem with that is, first of all, it's a very difficult procedural description of the algorithm. But more importantly, he only considers the case of a single constructor. So if you really are interested in this more general case with multiple uh, recursive types, with multiple constructors, uh, it doesn't, the generalization is not uh, straightforward. Um, and then there was this work. Uh, at Stanford, uh, one of my students, um, who actually did all kinds of crazy stuff with term algebras combined with uh, length constructors and quantifier elimination. Some impressive work, uh, but he considered the quantifier free part of it to be trivial, uh, so much so that they, they give a, a, a very simple non-deterministic algorithm for it in about a paragraph. And it is true that this works, but unfortunately, it's not uh, at all an efficient algorithm. So if you're interested in doing this in practice, you have to ask yourself, what, how would you implement this? Uh, so, um, uh, and then, okay, and then there's also some related work using superposition for this. Um, but they're, even, they're also quite far removed from the implementation level. So we're interested in actually implementing this in our theorem prover, and the questions we had is how do we do this in an efficient way? Okay, so before I show you the procedure, um, one important concept, if you are familiar with some of this work, uh, you'll, you may recognize this, uh, but one important concept in understanding how the rules work is this idea of a term graph. So um, essentially what you can do is you want to look at a term, the syntactic form of a term, and think of the associated graph in terms of how things uh, line up in the underlying model. Right, so notice here that uh, if I have a formula like this with cons x, y equals z and x equals car of w and so on, um, x and y are children of cons because this, the cons term is constructed from x and y. But over here, w is a parent of car and cutter of w because those are children of w in the underlying uh, representation. So it's kind of interesting because sometimes the function symbol goes down the graph and sometimes the function symbol goes up the graph. But if you understand the underlying representation, it's clear why. Uh, so this kind of a, a graph is useful in understanding how, to, how the, the rules work. Uh, OK, so I'm going to show you the rules. And I'm going to show you uh, how the rules work by several examples. I think that's by far the easiest way to understand it. And there's, I, I, would, I have to say there's nothing particularly deep here. I don't think we just, there's a couple of interesting ideas. But what was uh, important to me was by the time we were done, it w we had a nice algorithm. It was easy to prove correct, terminating, complete. And it was very straightforward to map this into an implementation. Uh, and one of the really nice features of this is we used, um, I've become a big believer in this abstract uh, presentation, rule-based presentation of decision procedures. Because it allows you, um, if you give a procedural uh, repre representation, 
things are very sort of interlocked. But if you give this rule-based presentation, I think we have maybe 20 different rules. Each rule is, very, is pretty simple uh, once you understand it. Um, and it's completely independent from the other rules. And it's only in the proofs that you have to look at the interactions between the rules and make sure that they terminate and are sound and complete and so on. Actually, termination and completion is where you have to look at the interaction of the rules. So the nice thing is, when I was implementing this, I was able to just take a one rule at a time, uh, figure out how best to plug it into the system. I could test out you know, a, a subset of the rules, make sure they were working. And uh, I think this was really the greatest success of this work, was kind of as a proof of concept of this way of presenting decision procedures. So I'm a big believer in giving a nice, uh, abstract, rule-based uh, decision procedure. All right, so the first set of rules, uh, if you're familiar with abstract congruence closure, we, we uh, stole several ideas from that. And the first set of rules are just uh, flattening rules, um, which allow you to essentially label each term in your term structure with some abstract variable, which represents an equivalence class. So the way this works is, uh, here's, here's this little running example. Um, we have cons x, y equals z, x equals car of w, y equals cutter w, w is not equal to z, and w is, uh, is cons. Uh, so, so the first thing we do is we use this, um, this arrow to, uh, to represent the labeling of a, of a node with a particular abstraction variable. So this is the flattening rule. Uh, so we flatten by assigning everything its own abstraction variable. The v's are the abstraction variables. So x, y, and z get abstraction variables. Um, then cons of v2, v3, that's, that's what used to be cons of x, y, gets assigned an abstract variable, and so on. Uh, so we've got seven different abstract variables here corresponding to the terms in our formula. And then for each abstract, formula, or for each abstract variable, we have a labeling. And the labeling represents the possible constructors that term could have been constructed with. And this is how we're going to uh, take care of the problem of multiple constructors. Uh, we're going, basically, at first, uh, all bets are off. Anything could have been constructed with anything. And we're slowly going to try to figure out which constructors were used and maybe see if we can avoid d making decisions about some of those things. And that's going to save us on efficiency. Yeah. But you do this in the e-graph, or you do this in, in addition to the e-graph? Uh, well, well, again, this is uh, an abstract representation of the, of the algorithm. So in the abstract representation, these are additional annotations. So this labeling is explicit syntax, syntax in our abstract description. Uh, but of course, if you are implementing it, uh, you, may, you may just annotate the e-graph itself or the term structure just in, in much the same way as we, in the implementation, we don't actually add these abstraction variables. Uh, those are just the equivalence classes. OK, good, good question. Uh, OK, so to begin with, everything could, uh, this is in the theory of lists here, um, and everything could have been constructed with either cons or null, except a v4. And the reason is that in our abstraction rule, if you abstract a cons, you, you immediately label it with just the constructor, because there's, there's no need to consider other possibilities. All right, and everything else is just, uh, is just factoring out that abstraction. And so our, uh, our term graph here at the bottom just looks like this. So v4 and v5 are the, are the cons nodes and, and so on. All right, and these are, uh, I don't even have the rules there, but, but essentially they just introduce those variables and don't do anything else except if you abstract a cons, which introduces that labeling. Yeah? So you're not going to infer that v5 is a cons node at this point? Because no. you do a cop. No, because in fact, uh, that's not even a plot. Uh, like, like I said before, in the, in the theory that I presented, it's OK to apply a car to a non-cons node. It's, a, it's maybe a degenerate case, but the theory we're deciding allows that, because we don't have any mechanism in first order logic to not allow that, essentially. So any mechanism you have has to be built on top of it, not, not within the theory itself. It's a good question. All right, then we have some simple rules. Uh, this is not worth spending much time on. Um, but essentially, it says, if I know that two equivalence classes or abstract variables are equal, 
then I orient them in a certain way. This is uh, essentially in order to pick one equivalence class to represent both of them. And we just have a total ordering on, we assume a total ordering on these equivalence classes or abstract variables. Uh, if we know that uh, we have a violation of reflexivity, we can derive inconsistent. And then we can always remove these tester variables just by reflecting uh, the same information using these labels, right? So if I know that V has to be uh, constructed with CJ, then I say V is labeled with just the constructor CJ. And similarly, if I know that it's not constructed by CJ, then I label it with everything except CJ. And uh, this, this is one of the places where if you're doing um, multiple types, uh, you, just, you just have to make sure that you put only the constructors of the appropriate sort there, not all possible constructors. Okay, so those are all pretty straightforward. All right, so after the little, literal level rules with our same uh, running example here, um, what's changed? Well, the only thing that's really changed um, is that where V5... Uh, ah, so this comes back to your question. So now we, we do know that V5 is a cons node, not because car was applied to it, but because if you look in the previous slide, we have this is cons, right? So the is cons forces it to be a cons node. Okay. <coughs> and then the other thing we did is we oriented these equations uh, between abstract variables. So those are all oriented now. And uh, I, I think the ordering is just by number. So the lower number are, are the smaller ones. All right, so nothing too uh, earth shattering yet. So the next thing we have are these uh, so-called selector rules. And the idea here is to try to make your, um, I guess the intuition is to try to match the this this graph structure more in the in the syntax of the formula. So essentially, what we're trying to do is eliminate the selectors and get everything in terms of the constructors. So the first rule says that if you have some selectors applied to some node U, uh, and you know that U is constructed with only a single constructor, CJ, uh, then you can instantiate U and throw out all the select terms. Okay, so, so this is actually fairly important. So the idea here, each of these selectors, we know what it evaluates to, U1 through U, UN. And so we get rid of those selectors and just replace this term U with a constructor of the U, UIs. Okay? Um, so again, it's, it's, it's trying to push the representation towards a more constructive representation rather than a selective representation. Now people have done it the other way, getting rid of the constructors and doing everything in terms of selectors. Uh, I think that works too. We just chose this way. Um, now, one one thing you might ask is, what if what if I have you know car applied to you, but I don't have cutter applied? Then, according to this rule, I can't apply it. Um, what we actually do is in the abstraction rules, if any selector is applied to a node, we introduce all of the selectors. And again, this is just a, a formal mechanism that makes it easy. Uh, then then you can apply this rule. Okay, because we really do want to eliminate all the selectors at once, and we don't want to worry about whether some are missing or not. So we just, in the formalism, we just introduce them all during abstraction and get rid of them all in instantiation. Again, in an actual implementation, uh, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. You could just keep track of which, which terms had any selector applied, and then you could use this rule. Uh, there's another rule for finite constructors that's similar to this one, the difference is, well, first let me explain what a finite constructor is. Finite constructor is, uh, is a constructor, um, uh, let's see, wh which only has a finite number of terms that can be constructed using that constructor in the underlying model. So a very simple example is the null constructor. There's only one term that can be constructed with the null constructor, the null term, right? Uh, another example would be if you had an enumeration of just, you know, A, B, C, D. Those are all different constructors. Each of those are finite. And it turns out that if a term 
if you've reduced a term to the point where it's labeled by only finite constructors, then you have to instantiate that even if it's not selected. And the reason this is a completeness problem where um, you really, basically, we don't know anything better to do for these terms that could be constructed with finite constructors than to guess which of those constructors it is and just keep splitting until we know exactly which one it is. So, so the, the important distinction here is this instantiate one rule is a little bit smart because you only have to instantiate a term if it's been selected from. If a term has not been selected from, we never instantiate it. And in fact, we also never have to commit ourselves to which constructor it was constructed by. So that's a, a savings. But for, finite, for terms labeled with finite constructors, we don't have that luxury. We have to instantiate all of them. OK, the collapse rules are pretty straightforward. This just says that if I have a selector <laughs> applied to a, a term that's a constructor, I just get the appropriate uh, uh, subterm selected out. That's what collapse 1 says. And collapse 2 just is our, our special rule of if I apply a selector to the wrong constructor, then uh, I just get this designated term here. Here it's called T, whatever I decided to give my, my theory of complete semantics. So for example, uh, I might use, I might just always use null there if I do a select of, of a constructor or a, a car. If I do a, sorry, a cutter in the list constructor applied to null, I might define that to be null, for example. Yeah. Or are you also suggesting that you actually remove that uh, selector, like in the class? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. could be, I mean, otherwise, it could be that if that were used in many places, maybe that would be more efficient to keep it around, but, but you actually get rid of it. Right, we get rid of it. And the hope, the hope is that you, well, one of the ideas is to try to define the designated term in such a way that it will induce a series of collapses and, and lead very quickly to that case being ruled out. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the whole point here is to get rid of all the selectors. And in our completeness proof, you know, we actually prove that you eventually get rid of all the selectors. And then uh, you can build a model out of the resulting terms. So by definition, finite constructors will not have any selectors. Uh, OK, good question. It's actually not quite true, because what you could have is, um, uh, in the case of mutually recursive types, you could have an enumeration type. And then that type could be the argument to a constructor in one of your other types. right? So it's a little more general. You have to think, is it possible to have an infinite number of um, of instances of this particular type to know whether the type is finite it's or not. Pairs of an enumeration type. Right. Yeah. It's only a finite number of pairs. They don't explode. So I mean, your intuition is correct, but it's a little, it's a little more general than that. You just have to track that explicitly. OK. So uh, let's go back to where we were. So notice we had, um, we had this w which is labeled by v5 and selected by car and cutter, right? So this is a candidate for our instantiation <laughs> rule. And so that's exactly what we do. Uh, we get rid of the car and cutter and replace it with cons of v6, v7 goes to v5, OK? You see, you see that rule? Let me just go back there. So I have car of v5 is v6, cutter of v5 is v7. Right, that's this this, this this structure here. And now, because I have because I know what v5 was constructed with, it's a cons. I can actually instantiate that and uh, capture all the information of that graph in this one formula that says cons of v6, v7 is v5. Okay, so that's an example of that rule. Uh, okay. Now notice. Um, Notice what the equivalence classes are that I have here. So uh, that's what this little diagram is going to do. So um, v6 is mapped to v2. v7 is mapped to v3, right? And v4 is mapped to v1. So, so I know that these are the, uh, the different terms in the graph that are supposed to be equal. Now, um, it's pretty clear that. I have this pair here where the, the children are pairwise equal and that I need to do some kind of congruence closure. So we just 
grab the some convenient abstract congruence closure rules. Um, you know, these are from from existing work. And essentially, what this allows you to do is just whenever you have uh, you know that two equivalence classes are equal, u and v, you can replace u in you can replace any term where u appears uh, with the equivalent ter term where v appears instead of u. That's basically what all these rules are doing. Th there's um, the only one that's not like that is the superpose rule, which says if you have the same term labeled with two different equivalence classes, merge the equivalence classes. All right, so if we do that, um, we apply this superpose rule, and notice that uh, um, cons v2, v3 is pointing to both v1 and v5. So we first merge those two equivalence classes. Then uh, after applying the simplify rule, over here we have v5 not equal to v1. And uh, since we know that v5 does equal v1, we get this v1 not equal to v1. And then finally that derives an inconsistent with our inconsistency rule. So this first example now we're done. And uh, uh, basically, for this example, we needed um, the sort of basic rules, abstraction, flattening, and literal level rules. And then we had to use a little bit of um, congruence closure and a little bit of instantiation. And that was enough for this, for this example. OK, there are more rules, however. So we have to look at another example to see how those work. So here's another example. This one's a little bit more sophisticated. Here we have, uh, suppose cons x, y equals w. Cutter of w is equal to cutter of y. And y is not null. Uh, so I think, again, it's useful to draw the, the term graph over here. So what is it we're looking at? Um, well, y appears as a child of this cons node. But it also appears, uh, we're selecting it here but with this cutter. So we have now a two-level tree, whereas in the last example, we only had a single-level tree. And then we also have null and w, and w has been selected. So this is the, the basic term graph. Uh, OK, and then after we do abstraction and the original uh, sort of simple literal rules, we have this structure. Um, again, the only thing we know constructed with a con so far is v4 because it's a cons node. And we've got nine equivalence classes here so far. All right, so what do we do now? Um, we can do some simplifying. Uh, let's see. That's because we know that v5 equals v4 and v9 equals v7. So we can replace v5 and v9 everywhere they appear. So let's do that. Um, what can we do now? Well. Um, notice that we have v4 labeled with two different sets of labels at this point. So one, another set of rules we have is dealing with uh, these sets of labels. And it's just the obvious thing. You want to always intersect them. And if you ever get an empty intersection, that's an inconsistency. So those are the two labeling rules we have. Uh, OK, and then. Let's see, if you go back here, notice we can again do some instantiation. So we have um, cons v2, v3, or, or sorry, we have w is v4, and w is being selected um, with car and cutter, and also v3 is being selected with car and cutter. So we can instantiate both uh, v3 and v4, um, right, which are which is this one and this one. These can both be instantiated. Uh, let's see, is that right? Well, we can instantiate v4 because we know it's a cons node. We can't instantiate v3 yet because we, do, we, have, we don't know what that is, right? So we instantiate v4. OK. Um, now, uh, what have we got here? It looks like, yeah, uh, that's true. So we can merge those. Let's see if I got that. Um, 
actually, let's see, can we do, no, um, yeah, that's right. That's exactly what this, <laughs> what the little blue thing shows. So notice that cons x, y, and w are known to be equivalent there. And also coulder of w and coulder of y are known to be equivalent. But with the rules I've shown you so far, uh, I don't think there's anything else we can do at this point. So what else do we need to do? Well, when, when I have, I showed you the, the congruence closure type ro rules, which are essentially upwards closure rules going up the graph. And now we need to do the similar thing going down the graph. So if I know that these two are equal, I know that their children are also pairwise equal, just uh, basic unification. So um, the decompose rule is the most basic version of that. It just says if I have uh, constructors, the same constructor, but with different arguments, and they're known to be equal, then I know the children are equal. Um, uh, a sort of trivial case is if I have two constants that are equal, I know that's, uh, that's inconsistent. And then finally, the cycle rule tells me that if I can find a cycle in my graph, modulo uh, equivalence classes, that's, um, that's also inconsistent because my underlying model doesn't have cycles, right? Does that make sense? Okay, this is, this is a, a little bit hard to parse here, this cycle rule, but you'll see the example of it is very simple. It, for example, if I have um, car of u equals u, that's the cycle. Or I guess coulder of u equals u is, is a well-typed cycle, where I know that u has to have the cons type. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the universe. Like I said, there's not, nothing particularly um, revolutionary in these rules. It's just coming up with them in a nice way that uh, allows you to understand them individually. Okay, so after we do decompose, uh, we now know that the children are pairwise uh, equal here. And uh, we can do a couple more uh, orients and simplifies to get. Uh, to get things back in shape. Uh, so what do we know now? Well, at this point, um, we have a situation where, uh, where V3 is being selected from, but we don't know the constructor that was used to construct V3, right? And so in order to, in order to, to get to the bottom of things, we have to make a decision about that constructor. And this is where we finally have to do some splitting. So our split rule looks like this. It says, if I have a term that is selected, OK, so we don't ever need to split. Well, unless the constructors are finite, we don't ever need to split on a term that's not selected. But if the term is selected, and it's selected with uh, more than one constructor, including the right constructor for the selector, then we do the following split. We, we split on the case where it's constructed with the right constructor, and the other case is if it's constructed with anything but the right constructor. Now the nice thing about this is even if you have a large number of constructors, both of the, each of these um, case splits should, you shouldn't have to do any more splits on this constructor, because the one on the left you can immediately instantiate. And the one on the right, um, you can immediately collapse because now the selector is applied to a constructor of the wrong type and it just collapses to whatever the ground term is. So I think this was one of our key insights is that um, in the sort of naive approach, you do this guess of what are all the constructors labeling all the terms. And that's, that seems to be pretty badly exponential. But if you look at this rule, you always only have to split into two cases. So that's nice. And you don't even always have to do it. You only have to do it if the term is selected. So I think those were two of our key insights we got by analyzing this procedure carefully. OK, so if we do that, uh, let's take the first case split. It says, suppose v3 is a cons node. OK, so now we can instantiate. Uh, and we get this instantiation for V3 in terms of the cons of V8 and V3. And then, uh, then we immediately have inconsistency by the cycle rule because V3 appears on the left and on the right there. Okay, so that case doesn't work, so we can backtrack. 
and try the other case, which is suppose V3 is constructed with null. Um, now what happens? Well, we can again instantiate uh, because we know it's constructed by null, and so we have that null maps to V3. But then we can superpose that and get V3 maps to V1 and get an inconsistency there. Okay? Uh, so that's just a simple example of showing you how the case splits work. And in fact, now you've seen all the rules. And that's it. Um, so, so I think our, our contribution here was really to take something that was some, somewhat well understood, this idea of how you, how you reason about algebraic data types, and really decompose it into simple pieces, each of which can be understood easily. And then we showed that um, these rules are sound, complete, and terminating. And in fact, the termination does not depend on the order in which you apply the rules. So now you can think about strategies, like which strategy would you like to use to apply these rules? And of course, uh, one obvious thing you might want to do is to delay the more expensive rules. Um, the obvious expensive rules are the splitting rules. Uh, the cycle rule is also a little bit more expensive than some of the other rules, depending on how big the cycles can get. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what we did in our implementation. So, so I'm not going to talk too much about the correctness proof. We had, you know, we built some really nasty ordering and showed that it always decreased on every rule. That was kind of a pain. Uh, but everything else was pretty easy. Soundness, you just prove locally for each rule. And completeness, we were able to show that once you get rid of all the selectors, you essentially have the makings of a model. So is the implementation, uh, is the implementation reflect uh, the abstraction procedure? Since do you have these uh, reduction rules that uh, to a certain extent. So it's been implemented in CVC3. And uh, so, so the, the way, one of the architecture decisions in the, in the CVC project is we separate the reasoning rules from the sort of strategy. And th this was a decision that we made a long time ago, and it works out really well here. So what we, what we have is, for many of these rules, they correspond directly to proof rules. In our, in our sort of theorem building section of the code that's trusted. And then the strategy corresponds to when do you apply those rules. So yes, we have specific rules for, say, cycle or instantiate. And then uh, the, the actual um, core decision procedure part of the theory is just figuring out when do I need to apply these rules. And it, it actually worked out pretty nicely. You. Uh, in fact, it was kind of fun. I, I could do a, sort of a rule at a time and slowly add functionality. I, I did this, of course, like in a weekend before a paper deadline or something. But you know, each hour I had like another rule working, and so that was kind of fun. Um, it really, it was really nice to have that kind of a description of the algorithm. It's very easy to go from that to the implementation. So when over the last year we had Veronco here, mm -hmm. he gave us this whole series on uh, the completeness of the, uh, well, on well on first order of the resolution based they're improving on that part. Mm -hmm. So if he were here, I'm trying to figure out what he would say this is a special case of something they implement in Vampire, but I'm, I don't I don't remember enough of what he told us about. So somebody help me here. Well, is possibly. This, isn't, this some, isn't this just some special case well, of, of what the a resolution-based theorem. Well, well, here's the difference, yes. and I think this is an important difference to point out. Um, automatic theorem provers like Vampire require, if you want to do reasoning about theories, you have to axiomatize the theory. Uh, so, so sure, you can represent, like I've done here, you can embed this yeah. in first-order logic. However, the axiomatization of this theory is infinite. So you can't actually axiomatize this within an automatic theorem prover. And the reason for that is that you have to have an infinite number of axioms that say, uh, essentially, the occurs check. Yeah, occurs check axioms. There's an infinite number of disequalities that are forced by the underlying model. So in general, this is, this is I think, a key distinction between SMT and ATP, is SMT, you can reason about theories that may have infinite axiomizations as long as you can find a decision procedure. 
Uh, ATP, you can't do that. On the other hand, ATP is really good with quantifiers, and that's something that we're still working on. Termination. What's that? Termination. But what about you don't termination? necessarily get a decision no. procedure with Vampire. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You get a complete yeah, 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 one, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it might not terminate right, if right. the formula is satisfiable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, there are other similarities with, with ATP because we're, you know, we're dealing with ideas like unification, and, and they use those ideas mm -hmm. within. Yeah. And the importance of the ordering to completeness. Sure. I mean, that was like yeah. a huge part of his lecture series, yeah. right? So yeah, but I'm this, just... this builds on all that kind of research. Right. So, oh, oh, so, so oh. I mean, I think, what, said many times. I think what I would say is we're using similar meta theory. We're, we're talking about rewriting and termination and orderings. But the actual thing that we're accomplishing is not something you can accomplish directly in an automated theorem. That's a good question, though. In fact, I wish more people had that, not only the answer, but the question, because I think this is a common mis misunderstanding that people well, think. A year ago, we wouldn't have even thought yeah. that's the question. Well, <laughs> we a do. few years ago, I didn't understand the difference between SMT and, right. and ATP, but it's, it's really clear what now. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about strategies. Um, so again, yeah. Just an implementation question. Yeah. Um, so given a particular context, you need to know which of the rewrite rules are enabled. Mm -hmm. And so is your, you can actually query your um, context to uh, that. Okay. No, this is a good question. Uh, in fact, the way I implemented it is all of the rules are applied eagerly except the splitting rules. So as soon as I get a new, a new fact, I look, I immediately calculate which uh, rewrite rules are enabled, and I apply them <laughs> eagerly. And then only when I can't do anything else, that's when I look to see if the splitting is enabled. So, so I do have to do some, I do have to be able to query sort of my term structure to see if there are splits that need to be done. But I don't need to do it for anything else, because everything else is just done incrementally on the fly. It's, it's it. just one strategy, though. Yeah, that's one strategy. Uh, I, you know, I just sort of made the rough estimate that it's probably a good idea to be eager about everything but splitting. And it, it really depends. Um, if you're going to embed this in a big Boolean structure, then I think that it usually is always good to be eager about everything but splitting. But if all you're dealing with is conjunctions of literals, it might be a different story. Um, okay, I already mentioned this. The, the two contributions were a stronger side condition for splitting and the idea that splitting should be delayed. And this is, again, a nice thing about the abstract presentation. The splitting rule is contained in one, it's all encapsulated by this one rule. So it's easy to delay it, you just don't use that rule. Well, you have your system to be strategy free. Right. right. OK, so this was a, a little uh, thing we did. It, it, I have to admit, this seemed kind of pointless to me, but we got so many reviewers saying, how come you haven't compared with the, the published algorithms? And I said, well, the published algorithms just say guess, and that's obviously <laughs> more expensive. But OK, I'll appease you. Let's do it. Um, so this is what we did. It, interestingly, it was hard to find any real benchmarks, so we ended up just generating some randomly. And what, uh, let me tell you, I, I think the results are what you would expect once I interpret it for you. <laughs> Which, and the first thing to notice is that most of the cases are trivial. But of course, if you're going to randomly generate things, then most of the cases will be trivial. And so what you're interested in are what are the cases where you actually had to do some work. So on the left, I've divided the cases by the worst case number of s uh, splits for the two approaches. And of course, most of the time, the naive strategy, in fact, I think in all but three of 8,000 cases, the naive strategy had more splits, and usually uh, significantly more. Uh, so once you get out to like over 100 splits, you'll notice that the time differential is uh, you know, a couple orders of magnitude between delayed splitting and the uh, type completion or guessing approach. OK, so that seemed pretty convincing to me. Um, and then uh, just, to, just to sort of conclude, uh, the nice thing about the abstract presentation, it's easy to prove things about it, um, easy to try different strategies, and it made it easy to implement as well. 
Uh, we achieved our goals. Um, we, I think we understood now what is this theory, how do you decide it, how do you implement it. And some of the future work is, uh, of course, uh, applying the, the theory and, um, and looking at uh, maybe richer data structures. Now, an interesting story. Um, one of the complaints from reviewers of this paper is, how come you don't have real benchmarks? If this theory were good for anything, you'd have real benchmarks. On the other hand, as soon as I implemented it, uh, people started finding ways to use it. And uh, Cesare has, a, has several nice uses of it in trying to model type systems. And in fact, there are lots of ways that you can imagine using this theory once you have it. And in fact, I know you have something similar, had something similar in Sal, and I'm sure there were lots of, lots of uh, uses for that too. So it's just interesting. People were complaining that there are no uses, but as soon as you provide it, then there are lots of uses, right? So sometimes you have to work the other way around. There's one other story I should tell here, to be totally honest, which is um, the th this is, I think, the best, or, or sort of, I'm, I'm very pleased with this work in terms of deciding the theory I presented. But there's one little catch, which is most of the time you expect uh, formulas to be presented in such a way that selectors are not applied to the wrong constructors. Or if they are, that can't affect the value of your formula. So what we recommend in the paper and in some of our other work is using a TCC type of approach where you build a separate condition that checks whether um, your formula could, can possibly be affected by these bad applications of selectors. Now, we didn't yet integrate this idea into the procedure, but I believe it's the case that if you're going to go through all that trouble anyway of checking whether a selector can be applied, then when you apply this decision procedure, you may be able to get away with not splitting at all. Uh, and in fact, I think what you can do is just assume that the selector is always applied to the correct constructor. Um, we haven't worked out the details of that, so that's also some future work. But, but it looks like that probably will work. So that's, that's sort of for full disclosure, I think, if you're gonna if you're gonna approach it that way, uh, you may be able to get away with not splitting at all. But if you have a finite constructor, this is not true. Right? That's right. Finite constructors, you you always have to split. There's no way there. There's no way out. What if you have uh, if you have different um, such algebras and, and different sets of constructors, uh, then when you the whole system might have. Um, well, tons of them, uh, tons of different constructors. Does that mean that you need to keep track of, for each term, all of those constructors from, from all of the algebras? No, you just have to, when, uh, uh, presumably if your formula is well typed, then you just have to look at the constructors for that type. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. In, in fact, this was something we didn't know at first either, but once we'd written the rules and thought about what if you have multiple types? It, it all works out very nicely, and the paper cover, uh, describes that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so this looks awfully similar to all the stuff that I've seen in, in type inference, type resolution, space-based type inference. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm trying to kind of put my finger on, on what, what's different. So it's one thing that it seems obviously different is that you have inequality in each type system. They never right. query for inequality. So is that the only thing? I mean, uh, because you're, there's the way you got rid of selectors, that's all standard. That mm -hmm. Everybody does that. I mean, if you look at Hill and Miller type system, right. that's how you write it in the first right. place. You don't even need selectors yeah. because that's just tactical sugar in some sense, right? right. So, I, so what, what is it that I'm learning here? Yeah, I think really what we've done is we've taken the familiar ideas of types and we've cast it as a, as a first order theory. And so now you want to reason about it within this setting of first order logic. And some of the ideas carry right over, and some of them don't exactly. And so it was just, it was kind of trying to figure out if we want to think about it in this framework, what do we need to use and what do we need to invent? And I think the key ideas were understanding, uh, well, first of all, understanding this idea of, of selectors applying to wrong terms. You have to do something with that in a first order setting. And then that introduces this question of which constructor was used and how do you delay that. And right, in, in type theory, you, you, you will use the optimization that you just said uh -huh. before, that is you will then assume that it has the right type, uh, constructor and therefore you will use it. Right. So it's not quite as simple in this first order setting. 
uh, and I mean, if, if you're given this theory, this is how you decide it. If, if what you really care about is whether it's possible for something to be applied to the wrong constructor, then you have to use this other, well, there may be other ways to do it, but the way we do it is we first go through and sort of annotate the formula and figure out under what conditions could a selector be applied to the wrong that's constructor. Because that's exactly what type systems do. Is that that's their whole purpose: is determine whether you ever apply to the wrong thing, right? Uh -huh. And they and they do that very efficiently. If it's only the qualities that you care about, you just use unification, and there is no splitting involved ever. So that's where I'm kind of not clear. I don't understand what the what the difficulty is. Is it all by introduced by these inequalities? Um, let's see. I I think it's. It could be that things are a little more decoupled than they are in type systems because you could have a very large formula and you could have over here something about that X is constructed with null and something over here about you know a selector applied to X and there's some non-trivial Boolean structure of your formula that creates a dependency between those and guarantees that you're not going to have a badly typed thing. So I'm not an expert on type systems but typically I think you can do most things with local reasoning and building constraints. And uh, because we're, we're in an arbitrary first order structure, we have arbitrary Boolean uh, superstructure, and it's just a little bit more complicated to, to have those like constraints. Sense, you're, you're, you're building everything out of yeah. Yeah. So another thing, as you said, one of the implications that you have is that you to encode type, type system and stuff like that. I think when you get there, actually, I think your, um, your model is not the right one. Well, there's two things that I think are wrong with it. So you don't have infinite trees, OK? Whereas, in fact, if you do represent your, um, use these terms as types, you do definitely want to <coughs> trees, OK? Um, the second thing, uh, because their now- Their trees are unbounded. Well, why aren't they good enough? No, because. Because the, the 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 terms you're representing in your model are not the elements of the types, but the types themselves, and those need to be uh, recursive. You're talking about recursive types. Yeah. Like so streams. I mean, your list your you're list structure. Things like streams, for instance. No, no, I'm talking about your list structure here, right? Okay. So if if you're using in this case here, you're you're, you're modeling the 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 values of the lists, right? But you can similarly take the, the terms that you have and use them to model the types oh. themselves, right? And those need to be recursive, right? So if you look at type systems based on set theory, for example, they, they look exactly the same, except instead of equality, <coughs> you have inequalities, okay? And you, you definitely need recursive types there, and so you need the infinite one. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing um, um, about the application in the type domain is, of course, um, well, you want function types, okay? and the model is totally inadequate for that. So, have you? I mean, are you guys really thinking of going in that direction? Because then I think I see a lot of roadblocks. Um, this is really what you're trying to do. Function types. I I haven't thought a lot about the extension to sort of higher order uh, stuff. One, I, I think one thing that that I do know about that people have used is there. You can encode um, some higher order stuff by using the, a sort of meta applies operator, and I know that like the guys at Intel have successfully used an approach like that for using first order logic to reason about some high order stuff. So there may be something there. Yeah, and the, there's another problem that uh, the, uh, your recursive type will your, your type can become uh, contravariant. Uh, so, so you don't necessarily get inductive basis. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Chesar? Uh, yeah, if we can talk offline, <laughs> we can steal some of your time. Okay. A different question. Uh -huh. the, when you remove selectors and yeah. like the. Uh, how does that interact with um, with quantifiers? I mean, you might want to use such a selector in a, in a trigger. Do you, do you trigger it first, or do you keep things around to so that you can do the triggers, or do you just recommend against 
using such things and triggers? Okay, this that's a really good question. Um, we aren't there yet, <laughs> uh, but that's a fair question because that's exactly what we would do: is we'd trigger on the selector. I think. Um, let me think if if we've solved this problem already or not. I think we may have because uh, when we remove the selector, we don't actually eliminate it from the e-graph. Uh, in fact, you have to keep it around because you may backtrack or something anyway. And so I think the idea is as soon as the selector is introduced, it gets put into our, our set of possible matches for triggers. And then if you actually do trigger and match that, you'll just look up, well, what is the current um, representative for that selector. And so it's, uh, in terms of, in terms of, so, so the way in which you actually eliminate it in the implementation is that it doesn't exist in the representatives of any equivalence class. But it still does exist in some sense. You know which equivalence class it's in. So, so I think that problem is solved, actually. <laughs> Good question. So have you looked at the work by uh, Mac Allister? He's, he's been doing sort of a lot of, um, think of it as sort of term rewriting systems where he was using them to express um, program analysis problems. And, um, and uh, it's another sort of area where it looks very similar to you, you with uh, Maybe you're implementing an education no, or you yeah, yeah, express yeah, something yeah, like education, but yeah. he actually has thought about how do you um, take this kind of rewrite system that is very nice, as you said, and you can prove properties about it, and then automatically take advantage of things like the union find algorithm to implement the, the, the sort of equivalence class part of hmm. your rewrite system. So that might be just something that. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. that it sounds a little bit more like coming the other direction. We're, we're sort of people already building the system. We've got our efficient data structures. And then we say, oh, let's see if we can you know, take this thing that we want to implement and first write it as a nice rewrite system. It sounds like he's more like saying, well, let's take this nice rewrite system and now let's see how to implement well, yeah, it. I mean, originally, he, I think he came the same way as yeah. it, but then he sort of really said, ah, this is great. We can just express all our analysis using these nice redux systems, and how do we make it efficient? Again? Yeah, of course, the more that can be automated, the better. I mean, uh, w admittedly, once I understood the, the calculus, it wasn't too hard to implement. But it was, that was for me, and like I wrote the system. So if someone else wanted to do it, it would have been more challenging. So automating that would be great. So, so do you actually take advantage of the union file algorithm, or do you actually have your rewrite rules done for uh, No, we, uh, we have our own sort of, you have a deep structure. yeah, we have a congruence closure algorithm um, kind of built in, and we just use that. Yeah. When you compare the splitting of the delay splitting, did you, I mean, you're, you're considering no chronological backtracking and, and lemma learning? It was, it was just uh, conjunctions of literals. Right. So we were ignoring the Boolean part. But do you think it would help, I mean, the eager splitting? And, I mean, if you, if you have no chronological backtracking and lemma learning, do I think, I think that the delayed splitting would dominate, strongly dominate the lazy splitting because Essentially, what we're doing is um, we're we're still doing all the splits you have to, but we're not doing any of the splits that you don't have to. And uh, as you'll see in Cesare's talk, he'll talk about our our uh, our framework for splitting on demand. That's essentially what we're using here. Is as soon as you realize you have to do a split, you figure out what split to do, send it back to the SAT engine, and do the split. But if you're doing that. Does it make a difference to do the delayed or eager splitting? You mean if you had a, a something dominated by the Boolean structure, maybe? I mean, it does make a difference. That <laughs> I show you the experimental results. You are using the non-cosmic backtrack. That was my original question. I think the comparison. Yes. Yes. Okay. But but it's not there. It's not really a matter of of the backtracking. The problem is you, uh, by doing the splitting first, um, and maybe, maybe, I'm not, maybe it's not quite what you're saying. 
the, the strategy I implement here was you do all the splits first, and then you then you apply the other rules and see whether it, what happens. And essentially, a lot of those splits are unnecessary. There's just big port parts of the tree you don't need. Uh, so it's not really. I wouldn't. I don't think this the 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 um, results I gave are that interesting because I don't think you would ever implement it that way. But without a nice decomposed set of rules, it's not clear how to how to implement it in another way. So I think the the insight is by decomposing the rules, it's clear how to separate the splitting. If you just have this black box that Oppen gives you, that doesn't say anything about constructors, it's not clear how to separate out that black box from the from the constructor selection. Well, thanks very much. All right, thanks. So, um